Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more of Warhammer 40k lore, or, well, today a mix of 40k and 30k. But before I begin, a warning. I'm going to be doing a bit of an experiment today. I've been told by a lot of people and advised by so-called professionals that when I'm doing long videos, I really should be putting in mid-roll ads, and whilst I gotta admit, I find the idea little bit scummy myself, I want to have an experiment. I want to see what you guys think about it, if it completely ruins the experience for you, because I can kind of see how it might, and I also want to see if it makes any kind of economic sense, because at the end of the day, I do have to think of this as a bit of a business. But if this increases my revenue by like 10%, because people will just go like, ah, you know what, I can't be asked. I'm just going to turn on ad block, and which would of course be a decrease for me, then I'm not going to bother. So consider this an experiment, and of course I will only put it in in videos that are fairly lengthy. I'm not about to put mid-roll ads in a 20 minute law video, oh no no, we're talking 40 minutes upwards here, so please do tell me what you think about this idea in the comments below, because I am genuinely interested in hearing your frank opinion on this. So, let's get started with the law, shall we? We're going to be talking about Traitor Gene Seed, uh, since that recently has become, um, quite relevant again, because you know a certain maniac tech priest is gonna try to utilize it to make more special snowflake marines, which is gonna end really well, trust you me, but I figured we'd actually look at whether or not it's a good idea, because in all cases, I don't think it necessarily has to be. Now, of course, a lot of this will be a little bit of speculation, since we don't know exactly how much of the genetic material determines how they behave. We do know that in certain cases, it does determine a fair bit, for example, with the word bearers. But that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing either. So, let's start with the Third Legion, Fulgrim and the Emperor's Children. Now at first glance, this would seem like a particularly poor candidate for reinstatement, considering their everlasting and deep, passionate love for severely spiked sex toys and other disgusting acts that could only be dreamed up by true deviants. All the Japanese, one out of two. But... The idea of recreating the Emperor's children is not quite as insane as you might at first think. Yes, the Emperor's children went down a, um, <laughs> somewhat debaucherous path, but they actually used to be a very, very stand-up, loyalist, and very different chapter. In fact, back in the day before the rediscovery of Fulgrim and extra-large dragon-sized dildos, the Emperor's children were actually known as the Emperor's Diplomats, and this was in part due to their name, the Emperor's Children. That is not a metaphor, that was actually what they used to be. Basically, every single noble family on Terra that wished to ingratiate themselves to the new ruler, that being the Emperor, would send him their children. Therefore, the Legion became known as the Emperor's Children. These sons of the aristocracy would create a very, very noble legion. Not noble as in aristocratic, but noble as in spirit. Think of it like this. These children were taken at very young ages, when they thought themselves to be invincible. You know, that age when you think you can never be incorrect about anything. And they had been taught about their noble traditions all their lives. And now they are being indoctrinated to be Adeptus Astartes with said noble ideals being reinforced. This meant that they were a very, very noble and very traditional legion, excelling in diplomatic operations, and they valued the ideals of self-sacrifice, etc., above practically anything else. It was not until Fulgrim came along that the ideas of perfection really started to spread across their ranks. As such, I do not think that the Emperor's Children's Gene Seed is inherently flawed in any real way. I think the biggest problem would be keeping them loyal. Because that's the thing, they would be descended from one of the most hedonistic and horrible legions out there, one of the true despoilers of worlds. If you tell them that they come from this uh, less than noble heritage, I think that's probably going to adversely affect their psyche quite, 
quite badly. Not to mention every other chapter will view them with extreme distrust and disdain, although that would honestly be the same for all legions or formations brought up from traitor gene seed. You could try and simply just shame them into it, constantly telling them that look, look what your brethren's became, quake in fear at their disgustingly large strap-ons, and make damn sure that you never head down that same horrid path. Perhaps, perhaps. But still, I would rate the Emperor's Children as a medium danger legion. Their gene seed is not inherently flawed, nor is their chapters, or well, their original legion's doctrines. However, considering the sheer depths to which their parent legion eventually dived, I'm thinking this is probably a bear best left unpoked. Next would be the 4th Legion, Petarabo's Iron Warriors. This is a particularly interesting one, because whilst pretty much all of the other ones, except for possibly one, turned to chaos in a fairly direct fashion, the Iron Warriors are fairly unique in that they are willing to utilize the powers of chaos, but they also utterly out of hand reject many aspects of chaos. For example, whilst in any other traitor legion a mutation would be seen as a sign of favor, a blessing, whilst in the Iron Warriors, an Iron Warrior being blessed with a mutation will consider it a curse, a failure, his fallible flesh revolting against him. It is a sign of deep shame amongst the Iron Warriors, and the only way said shame can be expunged is to is to rip away the offending piece and cleanse it with fire, and then have the piece replaced with unyielding, unfallible metal. The Iron Warriors are, in other words, not particularly huge fans of chaos in and of itself in its corrupting influence. They instead view the forces of chaos as a tool, a weapon, just like a spade or a bolter rifle, and in some cases they may even embrace the more extreme blessings of chaos. For example, Petarabo himself is a demon prince, and they seem okay with that. But they are not as devout as the other legions, in fact, they usually refuse to give homage to any one god. They see the very act of even giving praise to Chaos Undivided as somewhat distasteful, but a necessary part of utilizing the powers of Chaos as a weapon and or a tool. To specify a bit more, they will utilize demonic creatures, for example, as shock troops. They will utilize the warping powers of the warp in their forge arts. In fact, on their demonic homeworld, they utilize the energies of the warp directly to create vast numbers of engines of war, to resurrect titan legions, to build their ships. They use chaos for everything it is worth while refusing to subjugate themselves to it. In fact, they would see such a thing as an abject defeat and as an invalidation of everything they did to arrive at where they are today. That is the really interesting part. The Iron Warriors did not turn against the Emperor because they found a better master in chaos. They turned against the Emperor to, in their opinion, free themselves from somebody who had become a tyrannical influence upon them. They had convinced themselves that the Emperor was just using them as cannon fodder, and therefore, he was not worthy of their service. In fact, Petarabo himself hates the usage of the word loyalist to describe his enemies, as he is utterly convinced that he was the most loyal of all of the Emperor's servants. It was the Emperor who betrayed him, not the other way around. This means that the Iron Warriors are not inherently corrupt, and there is also no inherent failure within their gene seed as far as we can tell. They did not turn because of an ideological reason, they turned because they thought they were not being appreciated. 
So they're not at particular danger for corruption from the gene seed side, and they're not at particular danger from corruption from an ideological side, since what made them fall, in the end, was a sense of not being valued, and this was particularly strong in Petarabo, who was utterly convinced that the Emperor knew of his geniusy, and in fact that all of the Primarchs knew what a special little boy Petarabo was, but they were just jealous and refused to admit it. I'm oversimplifying here, I'll dive more into the psyche of Petarabo when I do the proper video on him, but he was the driving force between his legion turning. As such, a chapter of Loyalists are formed on Iron Warrior's Gene Seed, would probably work out relatively well, assuming there is no minute flaw that has been overlooked, and assuming everybody keeps petting their heads and making sure that they know that they are good little boys and not at all heretical or cannon fodder. In fact, I would say that out of all the Traitor Legions, this is probably the one that would be safest to reinstate. And then there's the Eighth Legions, the Night Lords under the command of Conrad Curse. Do I even need to go into why resurrecting the literal Terror Legion might potentially be a really bad idea? Well, I guess I kind of have to, it is the point of this video after all. So, the Eighth Legion was formed specifically to be a weapon of fear and terror. The idea was that the mere mention that this force might be sent into a sector would be enough to get the rebellious little bastard's presence in said sector to stop acting like children and just accept being under imperial rule like good little bitches. And whilst in and of itself that's not a bad idea, fear and terror can be very effective weapons, we've seen that plenty of times in our own history, and you could even fairly easily say that if you act extremely horrible to a group of people, and if that prevents them from acting out in the future, that will be a net gain. It's basically the idea of if a war is so horrible, so devastating, so utterly unfathomably terrible that it makes the society that experienced it completely and utterly averse to any future warfare, then you're not going to have to invade them again, and as such the total amount of suffering the people will have to go through will have been decreased. Now, obviously this is technically correct, but we humans have a re- remarkably short memory when it comes to these things, in fucking incredibly so. Remember the First World War, the war to end all wars? Yeah, how did that work out? Not particularly well, did it? Now of course, this is a bit different from what the Night Lords did, they were a terror legion in the most literal sense where they would torture people and broadcast that shit on local television, forcing people to watch. Yeah, I'm thinking that will probably have a fairly considerable impact on the civilian population psyche, and they might decide, you know what, let's not risk those guys coming back for a while, at least for a few generations, but again, I do believe that this will eventually fester into a feeling of resentment. That's the problem. Eventually, people will forget, and at that point, the horrible actions of the Night Lords are no longer scary, because you are too far divided from the action itself, and then it just becomes a horrible action by a vile, repressive empire, and so on. I suspect no matter how you slice it, terror weapons will always be effective in the short term, but very, very rarely in the long term. And it needs to be brought up that the Legion was created specifically for this purpose. They were recruited from people who looked horrible, acted horrible, and asked to do horrible things to others. And considering how fond the Emperor was of Taylor making the Gene Seed to enforce the roles that the Legion was designed to fulfill, well, I'm thinking this particular batch of Gene Seed should probably be buried some deep dark place where nobody can ever find it again, as I cannot imagine anything good coming from reinstating this Legion. 
And that comes from someone who genuinely likes the Night Lords. I love their aesthetics. I adore Conrad Curse. He is the fucking best of all the Primarchs because he has such an interesting backstory. He's a haunted soul who commits the worst deeds possible, not in the name of committing them, but in the name of preventing even worse deeds from being committed. And yet, at the same time, he is constantly tortured by those actions and constantly wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? How do I know? How do I judge? If I've done the wrong thing, must I judge myself? But if I judge myself, that means I'm a hypocrite, because if I am guilty of these acts, and I did not do them in the name of the greater good, then they become the horrible acts that they were, and I can't live with myself. And as such, I must repress that part of myself to even be able to stand living. Curse ends up in this incredible position where killing himself is admitting defeat, admitting complicity in all of the horrible things he did, and at the same time, he can't stand being alive. Oh god, I love Curse, he is the fucking best, but... Let's not do anything with his gene seed, because, let's be honest here, he was one nutty cookie. Danger level maximum, quite obviously. Next up is the 12th Legion, the World Eaters, under Angron. And yeah, these guys are about as uh, bad an idea as the Night Lords, although not quite as bad. Before they became the World Eaters, they were the Warhounds. And while they were certainly a, um, unsophisticated tool, they were rather brutish even back then, preferring good old-fashioned head-on charges and extensive melee combat, they weren't anything particularly out of the ordinary. Rather than being bloodthirsty berserkers, they were shock troops. They were specialists in close and dirty combat, rather than simply mud-wrestling barbarians with chainsaws. They were a tactical force, with overreaching objectives and a strategy. They simply were of the opinion that they were more effective in the brutal melee of close combat, and considering how Astartes are built, that is hardly an insane supposition to make. And at the end of the day, that was a tactical and strategic decision, rather than one of... What should I call it? Passion? No, that's not the correct word. Sheer unbridled lunacy, in the case of the World Eaters. And said lunacy came about almost entirely due to the idea of the Butcher's Nails. Now, Angron, of course, was captured as a young lad. He was imprisoned and forced to fight gladiatorial matches. In an attempt to further encourage Angron to be the best monster he could possibly be, the locals installed a fascinating little device in his skull, a series of spikes that would constantly give him little ticks of electricity. They started out low, just, just a mild annoyance, like an itch you can't quite scratch. And the longer he stayed normal and sane, the worse they would become, until the pain would be almost too much to handle. And the only way to make them stop was to become very, very angry. And considering you are in constant, low-key ticking pain, well, rage is a rather natural consequence of such a state of being. And once the target became angry, the thing would stop ticking, stop pulsating electricity into his body, instead it would release lots of nice, cozy endorphins, making him feel nice and comfortable and lovely devilly. But not in any way quenching the mind-numbing rage that made the damn thing stop zapping him in the first place. As you can probably imagine, being fitted with such a device is not conductive to being a level-headed and well-adjusted individual. In fact, the precise fucking opposite. And Angeron is most definitively not the picture of mental health by any stretch of the definition. He also encouraged these devices to be copied and introduced in his Legion, which is one hell of a cuntish move. It's like, well... I have to suffer, so everybody else gets to suffer as well. Angron was a douchebag and a failure of a Primarch. 
A lot of people bitch at Lorgar, myself foremost amongst them, but if you were to point out a true failure amongst all of Primarchs, it has got to be Angron. Not only was he raised in slavery, not only did he fail to free himself, not only did he fail to conquer his world, the only Primarch amongst all of them who failed in taking over his birth planet. But when the Emperor arrived in orbit and discovered Angron, he found him on the verge of defeat at the hands of mere regular mortals. Oh, Angron. Daddy is very, very disappointed in you. So yeah, in the case of the World Eaters, again, there doesn't seem to be anything particularly wrong with their gene seed. Granted, they were a bit on the brutish side, so if one wants to be safe, uh, probably best to not, but they most definitively fell due to the actions and fate of Angron, more so than any actions of their own. So just because they're being a little bit too brutal for their own good, and because corn is most definitively a thing, I would say danger level medium to low. And now for the experiment mentioned at the beginning of the video. Enjoy whatever the fuck you're about to watch. I'm going to have to come up with some clever way to intro and outro that shit if this is anything I plan on doing in the long term. As I mentioned, for the moment it's an experiment just because I want to gather some data on, well, you guys' reaction and what YouTube feels about all of this. So, moving quickly along to the next traitorous legion, the 14th, the Death Guard under the command of Mortarion. Now, this one is a little bit more of an unclear case. So, the Death Guard, of course, used to be known as the Dusk Raiders before the coming of their Primarch, and they were a pretty damn standard legion. In fact, they were pretty much a bog standard legion. If anything, they had at worst a slight preference for attritional warfare, as they liked to employ large numbers of heavy vehicles, and actually coordinated very, very well with the Imperial Army, far better than most legions in fact, but this would all come to an end with the coming of Mortarion. Along with their Primarch came sweeping changes to the Dusk Raiders ideology, their strategies, their tactics, their organization, their motto, their everything, practically. Mortarion came, he saw the Legion, and he deemed it weak and rebuilt it basically from the ground up into a completely different fighting force, that being the Death Guard. No longer were they a flexible and fairly advanced military machine that just maybe slightly preferred attrition tactics. Now they were all about attrition tactics, because in the mind of Mortarion, anyone that would shy away from their enemy was a coward and a weakling and did not deserve to exist, and therefore, obviously, the only way to meet the enemy was straight up and head on. The Legion still did utilize a lot of heavy armor and heavy weaponry, but they were no longer utilized with any real finesse, flanking maneuvers or rapid blitzkrieg maneuvers, which was actually something the Dusk Raiders were very, very fond of. In fact, a lot of their tactics were based on their very name, the Dusk Raiders, as they were recruited from the old tribes of Albion, and their favored tactics were to launch large-scale massive assaults at dusk. This was of course the time when everything started to get dark, and the Dusk Raiders were confident in their own abilities to fight at night, not to mention the psychological effect of a bunch of really, really fucking scary people always arriving at dusk. But it was not only the coming of Mortarion, it was also the coming of the barbarous people themselves. In the case of the World Eaters, the Night Lords, the Iron Wars, and the Emperor's Children, the recruits from their new worlds were relatively well integrated into the Legion that existed already of the Terrans. This was the case for most Legions, with a few exceptions, like for example the Dark Angels, which had a lot of internal conflict amongst the Old Guard and the new Calibanite Warriors. 
In the case of the Death God, this was the same except even worse. The Eterans viewed the Barbarossis as as crude savages coming from a backwater death world. And the complete change to the Duskeraders in terms of their tradition, their legacy, their tactics, and practically everything did not exactly make for a smooth transition either. And as far as the men of Barbarus were concerned, they viewed the Terrans as arrogant, as demeaning, as if they were lording their very nature over them. Ha! I'm from Terra. I fought in the Crusade long before you dragged your ass from that barbarous swamp pit you call a home. The Legion was very, very polarized, to the point of many members within the Legion having open hostilities against each other, even at the highest level of command. And this was also reflected in the amount of Astartes that were purged when the Legion turned traitor. A considerable portion of the Legion, already one of the largest legions in existence, were purged on Istvan. And to make matters even worse, even amongst the elements that Mortadian had handpicked and decided would be loyal to him, even more of them, once deployed against their loyalist brethren on the planet after the bombardment, turned upon the Death Guard loyal to Mortarion. This might actually be a good thing though for the idea of reinstating the Legion, as it was very clear that many of them resisted the ideas of Mortarion vehemently, and it was the doctrines and ideas of Mortarion that eventually turned them traitor. This would therefore suggest that if they were to be reinstated, they would probably be a pretty damn loyal force. In fact, in all due likelihood, they would not resemble the Death Guard much at all, and there is even some suggestions that this has actually been done. There are certain chapters of Astartes created during the Cursed Founding that are remarkably resilient, suspiciously so, as if they are quite reminiscent of another ancient fighting force. This does, however, hint at a pretty severe modification of the Gene Seed. Seeing as they are so much more tougher than normal Astartes, that means that the Emperor did do some fiddling, so I'd probably say that based upon their apparent loyalty and apparent resistance to Mortarion, I'd say threat level low, but due to the fact that their Gene Seed is not quite um, standard, I'll probably say low to medium. And now for something really juicy. The 15th Legion, the Thousand Sons, under Magnus the Red, Cyclopean Magnus, Magnus the Sorcerer, the Warlock. This is an interesting one, because in this case, the Gene Seed is fundamentally corrupted. In fact, the Thousand Sons were almost destroyed before they could even meet their Primarch due to a fundamental flaw within their Gene Seed that made them extremely susceptible to random, large-scale, devastating mutation. In one moment, the Thousand Son would be a regular superhuman Astartes Mega Man, and in the next moment, he'd be a raving lunatic transmorphous mass of arms, tentacles, and mouths mewling happily at the sky. Rather creepy, and mildly problematic to boot. At the point when they rediscovered Magnus, the Legion was almost dead. It was nearing the absolute end of its rope. But to save them, Magnus tried many, many things, none of which worked, until eventually he made a literal deal with the devil, a warp entity, and possibly even one of the Chaos Gods themselves, in all you likelihood, the ones with feathers. In return for an unknown thing, they stopped the degradation and degeneration of his legion. And considering that was something a warp entity could do in the first place, that certainly does suggest that they were somehow warped or corrupted right from the very get-go. Alternatively, 
the Emperor might simply have made a mistake. Instead of two vials of green stuff, he might have added in three vials of green stuff and one of red, and that fucked up the chemical balance in their Astartes bodies, resulting in them turning into hideous mutated monstrosities at random intervals. Entirely possible. Although I'd probably bank on the chaos mutation a little bit more since, of course, Big E does not make mistakes. Another thing that hints at the fact that they're probably a wee bit corrupted is the fact that every single goddamn last itsy bitsy one of them is a psyker. <laughs> Which is uh, rather unusual to put it exceedingly fucking bluntly. And again, in the case of the Thousand Suns, Magnus didn't really do anything particularly ridiculous. He was tricked into screwing over the Emperor, and Horus, not the Emperor, was the one that sent Russ to him with orders to, um, take care of the problem. The Emperor's orders was for Russ to go to Prospero and put Magnus under basically house arrest until he could be transported to Terra to explain his actions. Horus, however, sent another message to Russ stating that Magnus would be chastised in a far more severe manner. And at the end of the day, the Thousand Sons meant well. Everything they did was well meant. They never wanted to turn traitor, and Magnus needed a lot of coaxing and a lot of coercion to turn against the Emperor. But that rather massive problem with their gene seed makes me rate them at danger level. Just don't fucking do it. Honestly, worse than the Night Lords, because at the very least in the name of the Night Lords, there is a possibility, a chance, however small, that they might not go crazy this time. But in the case of the Thousand Suns, without the stabilizing effect of Magnus, I can't imagine anything but a very rapid degeneration resulting in either a chaos chapter or a bunch of happily mewling monstrosities squibble squabbling across the deck of their starships braying at each other. So who's next on the list? Oh yes, the 16th Legion. Ah yes, this um... This one would be a good idea to resurrect, wouldn't it? The Lunar Wolves, the Sons of Horus, the Black Legion, commanded by Horus Lupercal. Or, well, you know, I'm being flippant, but perhaps it wouldn't be the worst idea. Again, unlike the Thousand Sons, they weren't exactly ridden with mutations, nor were they... interesting, like the Night Lords. By all accounts, they were a pretty normal legion until Horus got himself stabbed with a magical sword, which sent him into a bullshit dimension where the various gods of the warp lied to him. Or, well, that's the best part. They didn't actually lie to him. They just told him a truth with modifications, shall we say. <laughs> Rather good modifications, too. I'll talk about that in the... Uh, Horus Heresy book series eventually, but for now, he did eventually get tricked into it. He did, however, get corrupted rather quickly. In fact, the sons of Horus and Horus himself got corrupted at a speed very much so comparable to that of the word bearers. They were introduced to the idea of chaos as the gods and the warp far later than the word bearers, but within a relatively few years, they were utilizing chaos as a weapon and an ally at almost the same level as the word bearers. Not to mention, many of the premier characters within the Sons of Horus got corrupted very, very quickly indeed. Abaddon essentially turned into an entirely different person in the matter of mere months. And so did a very large portion of the Legion. Additionally, a considerable number of the Legion were members of the Warrior Lodge, which means they were already kinda corrupted. This means that I think there was probably something just a little bit wrong with their gene seed. They seem to have fallen a little bit too quickly, a little bit too easily, and a little bit too willingly for me to think that they are entirely innocent in all of this.
And they didn't have an excuse. In the case of the Death Guard, they have an excuse in the fact that their legion was extremely divided and polarized. In that kind of an environment, radical elements can grow quite easily. The World Eaters had an excuse because they were batshit lunatics. The Night Lords had an excuse because they were literally a legion of torturers. The Emperor's Children had an excuse because they were corrupted by an alien civilization without knowing it, and the Iron Warriors didn't really turn to Chaos so much as they simply turned away from the Emperor. And the Thousand Sons, well... As I previously mentioned, if you listened very carefully, you can hear the braying of Chaos spawn in the background. So yeah, I do believe that there was probably something fundamentally wrong with the Lunar Wolves, the Sons of Horus, the Black Legion's Gene Seed. Something that screwed them over quite badly and quite early. It might be subtle, and it might never be a problem again, but considering the last time it happened, I'm thinking we should probably keep Daddy Horus's sperm on ice for perpetuity. Danger level... heresy. Now we get to the 17th Legion. The Wordbearers. And the Lorga. Need I say more? I mean, really, the Wordbearers. And Lorga. Hashtag blame Lorga. The son of a bitch who started all of this shit. The ass monkey without which the Empire would be the glorious loving civilization it was always meant to be. Lorga. Fuck him in particular. Not to mention, Lorgar's bad at doing things as well. Lorgar wrote the Lectisio Divinatus. Lorgar literally wrote the book that it would eventually unify the entire Imperium in the belief in the God Emperor. Lorgar is the biggest failure in 40k. And considering Fail Badon the Harmless, that is one hell of a title to hold. But of course, we're not going to condemn his entire legion just because of that. We are, however, going to condemn them for another thing. So, as previously mentioned, the Emperor was quite fond of working in little nitbits, little tids and tads here and there, to reinforce the role he imagined the Legion would fulfill. In the case of the Word Bearers, they were genetically designed to be extremely loyal. The problem was that their loyalty was misplaced in their Primarch rather than in their Emperor. He originally intended, I believe, to make the Word Bearers into his chosen Praetorians, the role that the Imperial Fests were eventually to carry out. He wanted them to be his honor guard, and there are some heretical voices that even suggest that maybe, just maybe, he wanted to first unify the Imperium and then utilize the word bearers as his preachers. I don't put any stock in it myself because the Emperor seems to be clearly against the idea of being called a god, but hey, it's possible. But this is the real problem. This loyalty seems to be worked into them on a genetic level, on a fundamental level. It's literally a part of their very essence, their being. As such, making any more of their type utilizing their gene seed is almost guaranteed to fail, as they would be naturally drawn towards other word bearers and the teachings of Lorgar. I imagine what's going to happen is they're going to stay loyal for maybe a few decades, maybe a century if you're lucky, and then they're going to discover where they're really from. You can't keep a secret like that, you know? An adopted child will always figure out that it's been adopted. And once they do, they are quite naturally going to go looking for Daddy. And they're going to come across some of Daddy's writings. And then shit will hit the fan at considerable velocity. Whilst in the case of the other legions, I think there is at the very least a chance that they might stay loyalists, even in the case of the Ninth Lords and even in the case of the Thousand Sons, although, again, in the case of the latter. But at least there is the shadow of a possibility. In the case of the Word Bearers, yeah, no, just. 
just flat out no, it's never gonna happen. They're gonna turn to chaos 100% of the time. Danger level, inescapable heresy. And the final legion, the last legion in every sense, the red-headed stepchild of the traitors, the 20th legion, the Alpha Legion under Alpharius Omegon. Now, personally, I am entirely convinced that the Alpha Legion are loyalists. They fought on the side of Horus during the Great Heresy because they thought that was the best course of action for humanity, and, well, the Empire in a sense. These days, however, I think they've long since realized that, well, they lost the Great War, now all they can do is attempt a desperate gambit to defeat Chaos. There are many examples of this, one of the best ones being perhaps the Siege of Rax, where the Alpha Legionnaires pumped tons of Chaos reinforcements into a citadel they knew was going to fall. That seemed to me like a pretty obvious ploy, that they were basically thinking to themselves, well, we know this is eventually going to fall, and we would like to keep them fighting and dying for as long as possible. Additionally, the Alpha Legion is loyal, and the most basic sense. Everything they did, they did for humanity. But that, of course, does not necessarily mean that they are loyal to the Imperium just that they are loyal to the ideas of the Emperor and humanity. This means that reintroducing them is a bit more finicky, because while there is nothing to indicate that they would turn traitor for any reason, although they are a fairly um, subtle and subversive legion, they could however turn traitor indirectly, because you know the Alpha Legion at large is going to find out about any attempt to create chapters based upon their gene seed, at which point they will almost certainly try to contact and subvert said chapters. Again, they'll technically still be loyalists, but they will not be loyal to the Imperium. There is a difference between the Imperium and the Emperor. They could, however, be used as rather interesting bait. Say you organize a chapter, Say you sneak in a few members into said chapter that are heavily indoctrinated by the Inquisition, maybe perhaps even an inquisitorial representative or two, and say you then lay low and wait for a while and uh, see what happens. Could be quite fascinating. Then again, infiltrating the Alpha Legion in and of itself would be an interesting endeavor. And also, by the way, can I just point out how shit the Alpha Legion actually should be at infiltration, considering the fact that they actually brand the people they use to infiltrate? You'd think it'd be pretty easy to discover their agents by a good old-fashioned, please raise your shirt, sir, but hey, details. It's pretty hard to say whether or not the Alpha Legion might stay loyal or not. I'd say it's probably a bit of a... A bit of a 50-50, and dependent upon a lot of other circumstances. I'd probably say medium to high. Not because they'll actually be corrupted, but because the Alpha Legion themselves are very, very good at what they do, and they would almost certainly have a vested interest in convincing their new brethren about their way of doing things. So, what do you guys think about all of this? The uh, Midroll ad, definitely, and Gene Seed, because I imagine there's a lot of interesting theories swirling around which legions might potentially be reactivated and which ones would be a truly remarkably bad idea. And the fact that this is a slightly different type of lore video. There's definitely a fair bit of lore in here, but it's a little bit more speculative about a subject rather than hard lore, but then again, that's kind of what I do, so I'm interested in hearing some feedback on that as well, especially as I'm considering doing some more videos kind of like this, like for example the Blood Gorgons, and the questions of whether or not Chaos is inherently evil, or if it is simply a force of nature, and so on. 
So, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments below, and until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.